Welcome to Machines and More. This is the Radeon 6700 XT Nitro Plus from AMD board partner Sapphire. And it's one really sweet looking card. And a big shout out to Sapphire for giving me the chance here to review the card. Thanks for supporting the channel here. Now, in addition to being very bold stylistically, it is also a massive card measuring in at 310 millimeters long. 131 millimeters wide and the thickness is about 51 and a half millimeters, which still allows slim fans to fit comfortably with the card in the NR200 test system here. Now, the good news is that with such a huge card comes a large cooler. So you'd expect cooling to be pretty good with a large heatsink like this. And this is a triple fan cooler with two outside fans spinning counterclockwise in an opposite direction from the middle fan which spins in a clockwise direction. The fans are a bit of a hybrid design uh, between an axial fan and a blower fan. The sweep is quite steep, but it is very effective. And at a room temperature of 23 degrees Celsius, the fans settled in at about 40% for the thermal testing during Heaven 4.0. And the card stayed at a very comfortable 64, 65 degrees. So this is a very, very impressive cooler. Part of this back plate is notched out to allow for a portion of the cooler to be flow through. So if you are running a cooler close by, like a tower cooler right here, I'd try to avoid a setup where it would actively ingest that flow through um, exhaust, uh, such as an air cooler in rear exhaust mode or an AIO in the vic vicinity, um, something like this, which is exhausting this way is the best and it just allows this top fan to take out that extra exhaust. These heat vents are oriented perpendicular to the length of the card, so hot air will escape out the sides and the back of the card. And uh, if you are thinking of a vertical GPU setup, this type of card setup does work quite well, as long as you have vertical airflow in your case to match. So something like this NR200 where you have bottom to top airflow, that really would work well for a vertical GPU. The cooler is just three and a half millimeters or so thinner than the cooler on the Nitro Plus 6800 XT, but the total board power on the this card is specced at only 260 watts versus the 350 watts on the 6800 XT. So it is sized accordingly. The reference game clock for the 6700 XT is 2424 megahertz. And as with many board partner cards featuring high-end coolers, this one is overclocked relative to that spec at 2548 megahertz. And in practice, I have seen the clock speeds hit 2560 or so reliably in the games I tested. So about 125 megahertz boost relative to reference clocks. 12 gigabytes of GDDR6 for the VRAM and you have three display ports and one HDMI port for the IO. And the card receives power via a six and an eight pin power connector. Now the lighting on this card is actually quite well done. You have a long strip here along the back plate and complemented by a Nitro Plus logo on the back plate. And finally, the Sapphire logo lights up too. There is a five volt RGB port here. Uh, you're able to hook the card up to your motherboard's ARGB if you wanna sync up with the rest of your build's lighting. But I think most users will opt to control through Sapphire's trick software. So it is just one less cable to worry about routing in what would probably be an unsightly location. But looks are only one reason you'd choose this particular version of the 6700 XT. And let's just take a look at the performance of the card. Uh, one feature that RDNA 2 has is hardware ray tracing and the 6700 XT indeed has that feature. But DLSS is still something pending for AMD. Sapphire does have its implementation of an upscaling feature, which I'll test briefly during the gaming benchmarks, but it is not the same thing. And during AMD's announcement of the cards, they highlighted the card's performance against NVIDIA's 3070 and the 3060 Ti. So my comparisons here will be against this 3070 Founders Edition card I have on hand. Um, the 6700 XT does have an advantage in an additional four gigabytes of VRAM, but I really think this 3070 is a pretty good comparison for it. In addition, since this card is heavily marketed as a 1440p gaming card, that's gonna be the resolution I will be testing at for the gaming benchmarks. Both cards are tested with resize bar enabled with the Ryzen 7 5800X and at stock out of the box settings. And it's worth also noting that between the two cards, on average, the Sapphire does enjoy about a 0.8 decibel noise advantage from 20 centimeters away. And let's take a listen to what that sounds like with a mic placed 10 centimeters away.
So let's first take a look at a few synthetic benchmarks. In Heaven 4.0, the 3070 has a slight edge over the 6700 XT. In Superposition, a larger gap shows between the two cards. Time Spy Extreme's graphic score shows a similar gap. This one's in 4K. Uh, so based on synthetic ben benchmarks, the 3070 enjoys anywhere from a 7 to 20% advantage, but what about in a ray tracing benchmark like Port Royal? Yeah, as you can see, ray tracing is definitely an area where you might see this 6700 XT seriously fall behind. Now, quick check on productivity benchmarks, a different API here, so not quite apples to apples, but NVIDIA definitely enjoys an advantage here with having that optics uh, for compatible applications. All right, so let's get into some gaming benchmarks at 1440p. Unless mentioned otherwise, the cards are tested at highest settings. For Red Dead 2, the 6700 XT is seriously competitive here, and I think the extra four gigabytes of VRAM helps the card stay very competitive against the 3070. Assassin's Creed Valhalla is one of the titles that AMD highlighted as an advantage over the 3070, and here it definitely seems to live up to that claim. This card does enjoy quite a significant advantage in this title. So 6 Gathering Storm shows a small gap between the two cards. It's probably not a title you'd notice any difference in, but you know, it's there. Far Cry 5 shows roughly that same gap. It's an older title. It's not a big gap. Uh, certainly the Nitro Plus card is nipping at the heels of the 3070 here. And last for the non-RT games and Microsoft Flight Simulator. The CPU is really important for this game, but uh, when you're using some of the best gaming CPUs currently, such as with this uh, 5800X, you will see a meaningful gap between these two cards. All right, sort of moving on to some RT included games, sort of, because Wolfenstein Youngblood is one of those titles where compatibility has yet to be enabled for AMD GPUs. So we can really only do a meaningful comparison with RT off. Um, here, the 3070 has a slim margin. Enabling ray tracing, though, does appear to have the FPS for the 3070. Although, enabling DLSS does claw back some of that loss, and indeed, DLSS is a really important feature for RT titles. For control the gap, with RT off is about 20%, but with RT on high, even before factoring in DLSS for the 3070, the 6700XC is a pretty big drop in performance. Now DLSS does essentially make the RT penalty go away for the 3070. For Watch Dogs Legion, same story here. Small gap with RT off, but with RT on high, it becomes a blowout for the 3070. And DLSS makes this look even more lopsided. Now with this title, I tested Sapphire's Trix Boost, which allows the GPU to render at 2176 by 1224 for 1440p. And then it'll upscale it to 1440 and then sharpen it, which is okay. I mean, the image here you can see is fairly close, if a bit jagged, but in a scenario where RT essentially makes makes the game unplayable with the 6700 XT. It does make it a little less unplayable. And I think if this is the title you like, then dropping settings a bit in conjunction with the Trix Boost will get it closer to the playable 60 FPS. So unfortunately, if what you want is ray tracing, I think an AMD GPU is still gonna have a tougher time with that right now. And that's really where a feature like DLSS really drives home the advantage. This is uh, very much silicon dependent. But even though the card comes OC'd out of the box, you might get a little bit extra juice out of it. At least with this sample here, I was able to get about 200 megahertz more game clock out of it. And that was with a plus 15 power limit. That plus 15 power limit corresponded to a plus 15 watts of total system power consumption. And running Heaven 4.0 with this GPU saw a total power draw that was roughly equal to the 3070 while the overclock did push it up to about 320 watts. With the overclock, the Heaven 4.0 benchmark score did surpass that of the stock 3070 FE, but with Time Spy Extreme, there was still a small deficit. At any rate, the overclock did yield a quite meaningful 8% performance boost that also translates into additional gains for games as well. With a game that the 6700 XT is quite adept at, the advantage seen in the synthetics did carry across for what is quite a meager power gain. It's a great trade-off essentially with the overclocked card only gains a couple degrees and with how good this cooler is, it's really worth doing. 
As for noise, the fans with this cooler are remarkably good. And here's just a sound sample of the card at various fan percentages. All right, so to sum this one up, the 6700 XT is going to come in anywhere from slightly ahead of the 3070s to 25% behind, depending on the title. And uh, what title you like will really determine that choice more than anything else. And for future titles, I think having the better RT performance may be helpful, since unfortunately this card is really going to operate at a bigger performance deficit versus NVIDIA's offering and uh, not having a true DLSS-like feature really hurts right now. And this card's biggest plus is its amazing cooler and fan combination with truly great acoustic performance along with the uh, bold and dramatic styling. For users that have a little bit more space constraints, I would really measure your case carefully, but you know, even for SFF cases like this, it's not a real problem. Now, normally I think the fair thing to do is to index the performance of the card for how much it costs, but the hard thing right now about reviewing a graphics card is I have no idea how much this costs, right? Yes, the MSRP is somewhere around 580 and the 3070 FE is uh, $500. So on that metric, the card is definitely not as good on a price to performance basis, but uh, yeah, I don't think that's a meaningful metric at all right now. What I can say with confidence is that if you're looking for a high quality card that can handle 1440p for non-ray tracing titles, and if the opportunity arose to get this card at retail, I'd snap it up. There's absolutely no reason to hesitate unless you really, really want good ray tracing and DLSS. In which case the 3060 Ti or 3070 is the way to go in the similar price bracket. But for traditional rasterization performance, I think it's close enough. Would I pay the inflated prices for this card? No, but then again, I wouldn't do that for the 3070 either. Anyhow, that will do it for this review. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you like this card. Really hope that if you want to get one of these that you can. Definitely wishing you best of luck. And thanks again to Sapphire for lending us the card here to take a look. And please give a thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't already. Cheers and see you again soon.